Our friends at Perla are big proponents of simple, long-term investing, and now they're rewarding you for being a long-term investor too. Perla investors receive points every time they fund their account and invest. The more points you earn, the higher your chances to win one of their weekly prizes or the big prize at the end of the month. To get started, check out the competition terms and conditions and open your Perla account today using the links in your podcast player. This episode of the Australian Finance Podcast is proudly supported by GlobalX ETFs and the launch of the US100 ETF, better known as N100. N100 offers Australian investors exposure to 100 of the largest non-financial companies listed on the NASDAQ Stock Exchange. N100 focuses on innovation-driven companies, providing a growth tilt to core portfolio holdings. You can learn more about N100, including reading the PDS and TMD by clicking the link in your podcast player or by simply heading to globalxetfs.com.au. Welcome to the Australian Finance Podcast. I'm Kate Campbell. And I'm Owen Rusk. And we're here to give you the tools and knowledge to invest both your time and money better. If you're new, feel free to jump in with our Starter Pack series that aired in early 2022 or our Shares or ETF mini series. We've got plenty to share with you in today's episode, but if you want to catch us on socials, head to Rusk Australia on Insta and Twitter. I'm also found at Kate Campbell AUS on Insta. And I'm Owen Rask AU on Insta. Just beware of the fake accounts. We'll never DM you about trading strategies or crypto. And if it sounds a bit weird, it's probably not us. And just one final heads up before we get into the show. This podcast contains general financial information only. All right. Is 2023 the year that you finally decided to sort your career out? Well, I have got just the guest for you lined up today. Shelley Johnson is a human resources and management consultant, host of the wonderful My Millennial Career podcast. That is an extension of the My Millennial Money Empire. We've had Glenn James on the show before. She's a brand new author and all round wonderful human. Shell, welcome back onto the Australian Finance Podcast today. Oh, thank you so much for having me, Kate. I'm stoked to be hanging out with you again. Yes, it is wonderful to catch up. And I do want to talk about the book in a moment, but I've got a couple of questions for you first, and I'm going to put you on the spot here. What is the best workplace employee perk you've ever received? Oh, can I say what? (laughs) The worst one? (laughs) Yes. Or like, a you know, ping pong tables? Like, I'm like, ping pong tables to me are not a perk. Like, (laughs) Don't try and sell that as having a good culture. Like I, I often think, what's the best perk? Flexible work for sure. Every time, hands down. I want to work flexibly and I think most people want that. Now, shout out to anyone in healthcare or teaching or any of those jobs where you don't get that opportunity. Um, those people are on the front lines doing the genuine hard work. But for me, flexible work all the way, that's what I want in my career. Yeah, and it's super interesting. A lot of us didn't consider flexible work at all, or maybe we didn't realize that was a priority to us until we went through the last couple of years and we went, okay, I really love it, or actually, I hate it. I can't deal with this. I I can't get my calendar sorted out. Totally. It was all of a sudden in March 2020, we were all working from home all the time, and it was like this game changer. It really helped us to redefine, oh, this is actually really good for my mental health to have this flexibility. Mm. And looking back, what's the best career investment you've ever made? The best career investment I've ever made would be doing this, doing the podcast, actually. So, when, when Glenn James, who started My Millennial Money, asked uh, me and Emily Bowen, my co-host, to do the podcast, it was a real risk and I'd never done anything like that before. I was so nervous and communicating in that forum was like, totally felt out of out of my comfort zone but saying yes to that thing that was something that equally terrified and excited me was such a good career investment because it built this whole new skill set that I never had to develop and I think for anyone listening who's weighing up a career risk right now if you want to invest in your career and you want to grow your career you need to take good risks and one of those things is sense checking is this opportunity equally terrifying and exciting? And that's a good measure of whether you should do it or not. Yeah, it's hard to find that balance because sometimes those things that will completely change your life for the better 
are very scary at the time when you say yes to them or give them a go. I mean, I don't know if I had the same podcast story as you, but I, I when I started my previous podcast in 2017, I, I probably wasn't scared because I had no idea what I was doing. I just sort of bought a mic from JB Hi-Fi one day and took it home and started recording in my bedroom and mucking around with garage bands. So because I knew nothing about podcasting, because I didn't know, I assumed no one would listen because I didn't know what I was doing. Um, it wasn't as scary, but you might have started a little bit later, did you? Yeah, we d- you were on the cutting edge, Kate, of podcasts if you're starting back in 2017. We started in, yeah, I think we d- recorded our first one in maybe 2019. And okay, so the pressure was on because you're like, okay, people are going to listen to this. My friends and family are going to gonna think things about me, whether it's good or bad, what's going to happen? Totally, yeah. And I think that's always the thing, right, of fearing what other people think. Like that's often in the back of our minds when we're making decisions like these. So, I like your kind of approach of going, sometimes you have to do it for the process, like actually find value in the process rather than the outcome. Like the outcome might be that no one listens to this thing that I'm putting out there, but the process is I'm learning to develop my speaking skill or whatever that is. So enjoying that process side of it rather than the result. Yeah, that's that's really interesting. And it's uh, something you actually covered in the book about those different decision-making processes and whether you're focusing on the outcome or the process because they're different ways of looking at things. And when I was reading it on the weekend, so Shell just launched a brand new book, Sort Your Career Out, with Glenn as well. And it's a fantastic read. It's kind of like a career Bible for Australians. It's It covers everything from mindset and values to actually handing in that resignation and telling your boss that you quit. So most <laughs> books don't talk about that. <laughs> There's a lot in there. Yeah. Yeah. You had fun writing it? Uh, fun, fun in inverted <laughs> commas. Like there were some nights like Kate where we'd be up at midnight and Glenn would be writing his mindset chapter and I would be in the same Google document editing his work as he's writing it, just being like, that's not very good. Cut that out. And he's texting me being like, get out of the, get out of my document. Stop hustling me. And I was like, I'm a perfectionist. So I, it was a good process to go through because perfectionism is, is I think can be really um, damaging for your career. So for me, I had to let go of a lot of that perfectionism. But still had a few moments where I was like cutting and editing uh, his writing, thinking I can I can write this better or whatever. But no, it was a fun it was a fun process, and there's just heaps of there's heaps of learnings for me about my own career story and journey. And I know it's just going to be super helpful for anyone, especially if you're in a career crisis or a career decision making point at the moment. This book will help you figure out the next move you need to make. And one of the things I found really helpful because I did a lot of work on values and mission and all of that during lockdown because I had a bit of time on my hands <laughs> and you actually went through a process for working out your values because a lot of people go, oh, just find a job that aligns with your values or live in line with your values. And most of us are going, what on earth are our values? How do we how do we even get started? And you actually took a really methodical approach to here's a heap of words, you're brainstorming, this is what values mean. How do you refine that list and actually put a description for values because the word adventure means a lot of different things to different people. So instead of going, I want to be trustworthy, I want to be adventurous, I want to have be independent, you're actually defining those words, which I thought was really helpful. And then how do you actually use that to navigate the workplace and find a job? Maybe your existing job does align with your values, maybe it doesn't. Yeah, it's such a good point, Kate. One of the things that people do regularly when it comes to their career is they look at the external things. So we often go to what's the job title? What's the status associated with that job? What is the pay level? And instead what we really need to do is focus on what do I want for my life? What does success look like to me? And what are those deep beliefs or values that I hold? And so when we take people through this process, it's really coming to land on four key values that really deeply reflect who you are and what is important to you in your life. And if you can clarify those four things, and as you said, spell out what is the definition of that. So for me, one is growth. If I'm in a role where I'm not growing, I get really bored and my performance drops. 
because I'm just like, I'm not engaged. I'm not growing. I'm not learning. And so anytime I pursue a career opportunity, I filter it through that lens of growth. Growth to me looks like being out of my comfort zone. It looks like feeling like I'm really stretched and challenged, but not in a way that shows up as let's say incompetence, but in a way that makes me and forces me to learn new skills. So once you know your values, once you know those kind of four things that you're like, this is what I need to feel that sense of energy and joy and excitement at work, then every every time you go for an interview, every time someone comes to you and offers you a role, or even it may not even be a big thing. It might be, hey, Kate, we've got this opportunity for you to go and speak at this event. Would you like to do it? You then go back and filter that through your values and go, yeah, cool. That aligns with my thing. That's a pretty adventurous opportunity. I'm going to pursue that because that aligns with my values. Or if you get an opportunity that's like, hey, there's this new gig, but you have to work in the office Monday to Friday, nine to five. And one of your values is flexibility. Well, you're going to go, no, that's, that's, that's heaps. It might be heaps of money, but it's not aligned with your value of flexibility and therefore you say no. Mm. It's interesting how often we make those quick yes or no decisions without spending a bit of time to actually think about our values and what we want because we spend so many hours at our jobs and they're the people that often shape what you think, what you learn, how you grow, what your next role is. But often we'll be just like a two-week job search, a couple of resumes, just blast them out. LinkedIn for an occasion and uh, then we're done. And then we sort of like, no, nope, that's that's my career sorted for the next few years until the next thing happens. But I thought this book was really great because it think, makes you think quite actively about, well, how am I managing my career? Because I'm really the only one that is going to manage it. And so if I'm not thinking about next steps and my own growth and what I want out of a job, well, no one else is. No one else is. And it's kind of like a brutal reality to confront. And so many people, Kate, outsource their career to their employer. Like they put their employer in the driver's seat of their career and they say, I'm just going to let them drive this thing. And so whatever opportunities come up that they think are suitable to me, I'll just let them make that decision. And instead, we need to actually get into the driver's seat of our own career and own it. Like you're in charge. You drive the damn car. You take it where you want to go. And that means that you have to have regular conversations with your boss about your career. You have to have regular things that you're doing that stretch and challenge you and get you out of your comfort zone. If you want to create those opportunities down the line, this is where this idea of owning your career comes in. It's on you. And it's a bit of tough love, right? Because it is easier to sit back and to be passive with it and go, I'll just wait for someone to tap me on the shoulder for that opportunity. But instead, what we really want for people is that they are taking that ownership. Emily Bowen, who is uh, a co-host on My Millennial Career, she would often talk about this idea of career self-reliance. And it's this concept that it's on you. And that is, you can look at it in two ways. You can look at it and be like, oh, that's heavy. That feels like a bit of a burden. Or you can look at it and go, actually, it's really empowering. I don't have to sit back. I can I can control where this thing's going. And so if you take one thing away from that podcast, let it be that. Own your career and you can make things happen. Yeah, and I think many listeners have that approach to their finances and it's using that I'm in control of my own financial destiny. There are choices I can make today that will pay off in the future, whether that's sorting out my superannuation or investing for the first time. And you can use that same mindset that you've developed listening to the podcast, taking courses, researching wildly, wildly, (laughs) hopefully. (laughs) Widely (laughs) and wildly. (laughs) Wildly, yes. Um, Researching widely, but you can use that approach for your career and take a bit more of a proactive approach there. And Shell, you've given me the perfect segue because I really wanted to read out a short segment from your book. And I promise it's less than a minute because I timed it last night. And then I want to hear what you'd say to someone in this scenario. All right. So it's Monday morning and you're driving to work. You've downed two coffees already, but there's zero buzz to speak of. To say you're dreading the day would be a huge understatement. Your boss freaks you out with their fake smiles, whispers shouting and passive aggressive feedback. 
We've all had that. <laughs> Your teammates are as miserable as you and no amount of happy hour beers, and I'll add ping pong in there, can improve the bar- vibe. To top it all off, the just checking to see where this is up to emails in your inbox have been, have you considering throwing a U-turn and driving home to bed? Except you don't because you have no idea what to do with your career. So you keep driving and you keep hoping that this week will be different. Different and less difficult, hopefully. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So what would I say to the person who is, I mean, you know, we've all been there. So that'd be my first thing. I think all of us have experienced this. I can visually see myself in the car driving to work and having this in So my this head. is a personal anecdote. Yeah, and it's just so relevant to so many people. Like when we were writing the book, like so I think we can all relate to that Monday morning feeling of dread. Yes. And if you've got the Monday morning dread feeling, I want to say this to you. The first thing you need to do is to understand what's not working. So what is it that's not working for you right now? So I want you to diagnose the problem. Often people go straight to the solution, Kate, where we start going, oh, I need to quit my job or I need to move careers or I need to, and we, we jump straight to let's figure out a solution, but we, act, we haven't understood what the problem is. So in the design thinking process, it's this idea of problem framing. So let's get clear on exactly what's not working for us in our current dynamic. And then what we do from there is we start trying to find solutions. One of the things people don't do as regularly as they should is talk to their boss about what the problem is. So once you've diagnosed it, I want you to go and talk to your boss about, hey, this is the problem that I'm experiencing at the moment in my career, in my work situation. Often, one of these common scenarios would be that someone's been in a role for two, three years and they've actually mastered the role and they've stopped growing. So they're no longer learning. They're no longer engaged. So have that discussion and then ask your boss for help. Like ask for help. Say, hey, this is what I'm experiencing at the moment. I'm finding I'm not as engaged in my role as I would like to be. Are there any opportunities to re-look at my job description and better align it with some of my strengths that aren't being used at the moment? So really having that conversation about the problem and then seeing if they can help you find solutions internally. Now, if you have a boss who maybe isn't willing or able to do that, then you start looking at, well, what are the next steps? Are there areas I can move internally within this business? So there's some sideways moves I can make or are there promotions? Or if not, then we actually start to consider, well, do I need to start looking for other jobs? If I dread Monday morning every single week consistently and I have done for the last year, then it's probably time to start looking at whether you need to make a change. Yeah, it's interesting because sometimes we might be dreading Monday morning for a reason that's not what we thought. We thought it was because we just hated our job, but it might be because we just don't have very good weekends or we don't enjoy the commute or we there might be a whole heap of other reasons. So I think that diagnosing the problem and spending a bit of time, instead of jumping to, I'm just going to quit and move to the next job, thinking about what the problem is, can I talk to my boss or maybe the next level up or the HR team to see if there's any other solutions um, for that? Because sometimes you can change your role in your workplace or you can add some new projects or challenges to your plate. It might be slightly harder with the small business, like there might not be as many different departments to move around to, but I think that's really important to actually see, is there any way to solve this without just jumping if I don't necessarily feel the need to jump to a new job right now. Totally. that You're spot on, Kate. I love that. Yeah. And so if the person hasn't been able to find a solution, maybe their manager just does not want to chat or the job's like, well, this is it. If you don't like it, you can go. What would you say to that person next? Yeah. So I think that's where we start to plan our exit strategy. So We start to look for other jobs and we need to go back and do that values work of what are my values? So what are the things that are important to me? And then the next layer on that. So if we start with the values are like your foundational piece, the next layer is figuring out your strengths. So before you go and start jumping on LinkedIn and applying for jobs, I want you to look at what are the things that I am freaking awesome at? (laughs) Like the things that I do that I stand out for the things that people come to me for that 
I do better than anyone else. Work out those things and then start looking at jobs that will really draw out those strengths. Because one of the reasons we are often disengaged at work is because we're working a job that doesn't align with our with the things that we're uniquely good at. So find those zones of genius and then look at roles and job descriptions that align and then apply for those things. So that can be a way that we start to build this career that we love. Build the, and, and I mean like one of the things, Kate, I work in HR. So I've often had to deal with performance improvement plans with people and coaching people through a performance process. And often that process is extremely difficult for people to go through. One of the reasons people find themselves in those processes is not because of a lack of skill. It's actually just because the role doesn't align with their strengths. And so doing the deep work to figure that out and then going, well, hey, I'm I'm working in a call center and my whole job is routinized. Like every single thing that I do is routine, but I'm actually a creative and I like to have autonomy. And one of my strengths is strategy and and, and thinking big and, and exploring, but I'm in a role that doesn't allow me to do that. Well, of course, you're going to end up on a performance process if that's what you're doing, because it just isn't aligned with the things that you're good at. So we need to do that assessment when we're in a period of change in our career and look at those things and go back to the foundational pieces of values and strengths. And then we start applying for jobs based on that. Yeah, because I think so often we can just throw ourselves very quickly into the next job because it is scary when you're unemployed, you don't have an income right now, especially if you are living paycheck to paycheck and maybe you're not quite um, set up with your emergency fund you feel like you need to get a new job immediately because you've got bills, you're supporting your family. But sometimes if you don't just take maybe, I don't know how long this work takes because I kind of did it spread out over a while, but even a couple of hours to reflect on your strengths and skills and values and what you're looking for in a workplace, that could end up, that could mean your next job ends up being a lot more suited to you or at least a little bit more creative than your routine job that wasn't sort of aligned with you before. Yeah, we need that self-reflection time. We need it. It's so important. And I think take a day, set yourself a day, go, okay, well, on Sunday, I'm going to give myself a full work day to think about this stuff, to really do the deep, what I would see is the deep work of your career. The rest of it becomes easier once we've done this deep work up front. Yeah, and considering we're going to be there for 48 weeks of the year and spend most of our weeks there, I think it's worth even the day or a few weekends spending time thinking about and being a bit more methodical about the direction we take with our next steps. So, Shell, I have a few questions from listeners because I threw it up on Instagram to see what people wanted to know from you. And we have a few questions along the line of progression in my company that I'm about to move into or progression within my current role. And one of them was saying that they're a graduate about to go into their first official job. So congrats. How do they progress within the company they're about to enter? Awesome. Love this question. So how do you progress if you're a new grad or if you've been in a role for a while, this still relates wherever you're at. The first thing you need to do is clarify exactly what your manager expects from you. Often managers don't give you that clarity up front. So I want you to pursue it. Go and find out exactly what your manager wants. And then your number one job is to exceed those expectations. If you want to progress, we need to have that mindset. Clarify the expectations and then exceed the expectations. So let's say your manager wants you to review and document a business process by Friday. So that's what they've given you. What I want you to do is review the process, document the process, and then provide recommendations of how we can automate and improve that process. So you see, you've done the thing that they wanted by the date that they wanted, but you've added in this layer of I'm exceeding the expectations. So if you do this consistently, you'll become known in the business for someone who who over delivers, someone who exceeds expectations. And those are the things that help you to progress. It's not doing the bare minimum of the of the job. And I know we had a lot of stuff about quiet quitting last year and this idea of, I remember there was this thing on TikTok going around of act your wage. 
Did you see that? So, like, act your no, way. No, I heard don't. the quiet quitting, but... <laughs> It was like, don't do anything above your pay level. Like, just right. act your age. And Jack DeLosa, an uh, entrepreneur who does some amazing stuff, he did this hilarious review of that and basically said how ridiculous that concept is because it's don't don't act your wage. Act the wage that you want to get. Yep. And that's how you'll progress. And so, this idea of exceed the expectations if you want to, if you want to get into a management role, if you want to get into a – more senior position, will start doing the position before you get the job. And that'll set you up for that career trajectory that you want. Yeah. And I think that's really important, especially if you do think you want to progress um, in the corporate ranks and you want to go up to the next level. You want to be a manager. Maybe one day you want to be a CEO or you just want to um, get paid more in your existing team. Going above and beyond, I still think it's quite a good way to get there. I know um, many startups and I've, I've worked at one before, they don't have any processes or procedures written down for anything when they're getting started because they're just a few people that don't have much money. And so if you're getting in at the ground floor, you have a real opportunity to put those processes into place, document everything as you go because you're doing it anyway. And that goes that above and beyond. So I think that's a, a really easy way to get started there. And especially when you go to your pay review with, I think, you've mentioned before, we're building that folder of evidence. So when you go to your pay review, you've actually got a case for why you should be paid more instead of just saying, well, I just should be. Everyone else is getting paid more and you can use that. Oh, yes. I, I, you know what? I really don't like in the pay conversations where people come and ask for a pay rise based on things they will promise to do in the future. I want to pay rise and if I get this, I will do X, Y, and Z in the future. No, no, no. Like let's let's come at it with here's the stuff that I've done beyond already and it's exactly what you said. You've got your portfolio. You've got your evidence to back up that you've already done the work and so they're actually rewarding you for the work that you have done and then the trust is there and the greater chance of getting future pay rises is also there because you've demonstrated a consistent approach to exceeding expectations. Now, the next question is along the same lines of progression in the workplace, and maybe someone has got all of their evidence, they've documented, they've done everything you've said, Shell, but the next question was, how do you move up career-wise in your workplace when management has favourites? Mm, this is an interesting one. I haven't been asked a question about favourites before, so I, I, like reading, yep. <laughs> I liked reading this. Okay, first thing, question, back to this person, is it? favorites or do they just have long-term relationships with people? So, one of the things when I took on a new job a while back, the manager had existing years and years of relationships with people well before my time in the business and that's normal. And so, it wasn't necessarily that they were favorites. It's actually that they've got relational equity that I am coming in as a new person and I don't have that and that's fine and we need to be okay with that. And work out, okay, well, I've, this is a lot. This is a long game, and I need to build up a relational. I need to build up relational equity with this person. So that's my first question. If you answer that, and it is actually no, they have favorites and they play people off against each other. Well, here's what I want you to do. I want you to actually become an observer of what's happening. So what is it? that your manager likes about the other people? What is it that they're doing that maybe you're not doing? So if you want to stay in this environment, then I want you to observe what's happening in the team. So look at what other people are doing. Are they doing things that are different to you? And if you if you want to actually progress and, and I mean, this is hard, Kate, because we don't want to play into a leader's poor behavior. Like I really don't like that the the flip side of the coin is if we want to progress in the organization we're in sometimes we do have to understand what is it that our manager wants and what is it that they like from their team and how do I do that thing so it's a tricky spot to be in and I, I recognize that one of the things that you can do is is figure out if are there things that you're doing that are not helpful for the team like this is a bit of a self-reflection process. But if it ends up as you're doing this self-reflection, I want you to think about 
if you're changing who you are to fit into a cookie cutter mold so a manager likes you more, that's probably not a healthy thing to do. But if you're growing and improving and actually increasing your skill set and then becoming more valuable to the business in the process, well, that's a good thing, right? So do the self-reflection work. Do that work to go, is this an environment I want to be in? If so, then how do I become invaluable to this team? What are the things that I need to do to change maybe some of my skill set or grow my skill set? to be of service to this team and this business. It's an important distinction to make because it it might be the manager just gives the promotions and the pay rises to the people that he goes to football with on the weekend versus it's the manager that really likes the people who get in 20 minutes early to prepare and do some research before the day ahead or takes take initiative and bring him ideas on problems. So I guess it's I don't know, I was defaulting to a male there. But anyway, I guess it's, it definitely <laughs> applies to both genders here. And I think it's important to to take that time, as you said, to reflect and see, is this something I can do something about? Can I learn from? Or is it is it a workplace that might not be great for me? Yes, absolutely. I think that's the great question to ask. Now, there's another one that is definitely about the career progression. So, I think that's on everyone's mind at the moment. This uh, listener has been in their job for a couple of years now and wanted to know if there's a correct time to attempt to go for a promotion. Yes, this is a really good question. So, I don't think there's any timeline that you have to, you know, meet this period of time. You have to be in this role for two years in order to get a promotion. I think it's more about have you developed and mastered that role? So, have you mastered your current role? If you are still in the learning and development phase of your existing role, then I don't think it's the time to go and ask or seek out a promotion. But if you're in this zone where you've, you're have you nailing what you're doing and you're actually starting to feel like potentially there's this thing called Whitney Johnson – talks about this idea of the S-curve of learning. And on the S-curve of learning, if you think about, it's kind of like a wave. So, at the bottom of the wave, when you're in a steep learning curve and you've got this kind of high-paced, fast-paced growth, that's a really good zone to be in. But once you get to the top of the wave and you've mastered something, you actually are at risk of dropping off in your performance once you've got to that mastery kind of peak. So, I want you to be looking at your own, like look at this kind of wave of you. If you've really grown, really developed your skills and you're now getting to the point of mastery, that's the moment where you start to look for more more opportunities. That's the moment where you start to seek out a promotion. So, I want you to, I've got some questions Kate, that I think are really good self-reflective questions. So I'm gonna re- I'm gonna read them out because I've written them down in preparation for this conversation. Oh, awesome. <laughs> so number one, the first question I want you to ask yourself: Am I doing this job really well? Like, am I smashing it out? Am have I built internal credibility? So am I seen as someone in the business that is really credible and trustworthy in my role? Am I needing a new growth challenge? So, if you answered yes to all three of those questions, then it's time to pursue a promotion or a progression opportunity. Hmm. I like that because it is important to uh, be good at your current job before you add more to your plate because that might end up meaning that you dread Mondays because you've just taken on way too much before you're ready. So, another another good question. Uh, the next one is how do you turn the jargon from your workplace into transferable skills on your CV? And I have seen something along this lines going around on TikTok where people were saying, instead of saying you were a receptionist or you worked at Coles, you actually dealt with 3,000 customer complaints over the time at your work and you did X, Y, and Z. And that was quite funny to me. <laughs> the, the other thing, I hate jargon. Like I hate work jargon, but there's so much of it. I, I was looking at some job titles the other day around like a customer experience ninja or a digital <laughs> prophet or um, an internal communications dissemination officer. <laughs> Like, what, what are these things? Like, what do they even mean? And so, I think if you're looking at your resume and you're wanting to communicate 
the things that you've done that are transferable to maybe a different industry or a different career path. So let's say you're currently a project manager, but you really want to get into a leadership role. And so you haven't managed people before, but you have managed projects. We need to convey how the things we've done in project management can transfer to people leadership because they're, they're different skill sets, but there is overlap. So one of the things I would communicate on my resume is the skills around influencing people and getting people to work together towards a shared outcome. So you kind of have to show the things that you've done in your role that translate to the new role that you're going to and avoid any of that complex jargon, like the word dissemination. (laughs) What does that even mean? I don't know. So try and capture it that a 12-year-old kid would understand. So instead of if you're the internal communications officer, instead I would just say I create simple communication pieces to help move people to action. Simple. Like that's what I do. I, I move people to action with good comms. So really focus on creating simplicity in, in your, and especially in your resume and cover letter. That's what we want. We want to actually be able to convey what is it that we do in the simplest way possible. I like that. I like that. And something I had done in the past as well was looking at what kind of the type of jobs I'm applying for, what kind of language do they use on their website, their job ads, um, what kind of language do the people internally in the company use on their LinkedIn profiles? Because that also gave you a sense of what would what would matter and what would stand out to them when you wrote your cover letter and your resume, because that's kind of the language they understand in that industry. So how do you translate your existing skill set to one that's commonly used in that other industry or that other type of job. Yeah. So let's say they say holistic healthcare, use that word, pick up on the word holistic in, in your cover letter. And then what that creates is this sense of familiarity with you as the candidate. And they think, oh yeah, Kate gets us. She's using our language. She's using some of the tone that we use in our communication. And so then they're more likely to feel that sense of you're a good fit or you align with this, this role that we're advertising. Yeah, I think that's important because you might be a project manager, but if you're applying for a project manager job in finance or a project manager job in healthcare, you're, well, I would imagine I haven't applied for a healthcare role, but the the tone and the voice and the language um, and just some of those common words you use would be really differently required in cover letters and resumes for both of those places. Yes, absolutely. All right. Now, this one is... Uh, a little bit different, but how do I get back into the workforce after having a family or anyone that's listening that has taken some time off for whether that's travel or sick leave or looking after someone else? Oh, I love this question so much. And I had someone message me on LinkedIn the other day saying they'd taken time off as a parent to be the primary carer uh, for their kids and they were really struggling with their confidence of jumping back into the workforce. And for me, when I think about people who've taken time out as a parent or taken time off in inverted commas, I just want to say one thing to you if this is you right now. You haven't taken time off. It's not a career break. You have been working your butt off in the most challenging and important role that you that you would do. And so I just want to say to this person who's asked this question that you haven't been taking time off and I want you to, when you go in to start applying for roles, that you, if you're wanting to get back into a job after you've had, let's say you've had three years off, if you're wanting to get back into work, I want you in your interview to talk about all the skills that you've developed as a parent, skills that are some of the most challenging things that you'll have to have to build, like patience, selflessness, resilience, energy management, emotional management. Like, like I'm saying this right now, I had a crazy <laughs> night last night, sleepless night with the kids. My daughter, she's five. Uh, she woke up so many times because she's not well. And I just think those skills that you develop as a parent are so invaluable in in any workplace. So please remember that. And and that's my rant. <laughs> I, I know I've just like gone off on a tangent here, but <laughs> it's just something that is really close to my heart because I just know how 
challenging it can be being in this zone and the return to work zone can feel really um, difficult. So make sure you're not undervaluing the skills that you've developed in that time that you've been working as a full-time parent or full-time carer, whatever that capacity looks like. So that would be my advice. Don't devalue the skills that you've developed in that time. And then look for jobs that align with your values. Because one of the things that happens when when you become a, a parent is your values do shift. So for me, one of my values before I was uh, became a mum was that I really valued achievement. So one of the things I really pursued in my career was this sense of achievement all the time. But once I became a parent, one of my values changed and it changed from achievement to autonomy. So instead of looking for achievement, I really wanted autonomy that I wanted to be able to work really flexibly how I want, when I want, where I want. And so for anyone listening, check back in with your values and then look for jobs that align with that because that's a huge thing. Like that is a really important part of getting back into work and making sure that after a big life change, you've done that values work again. You've really looked and reassessed what are my values, what matters to me, and then you look for jobs based on that. Yeah, I think that's a really important reminder that if any significant event happens, like we say with updating your wills when you have significant life changes, um, significant life changes or time off work or things like that is a good time to do that strength skills assessment, do the values check-in and really think, what do I want out of my career? What do I want out of a job? Because you might be looking for the same job you had five years ago and it might not might no longer be the right fit for you because your your whole perspective on life has, has dramatically shifted. So, I think that's a great reminder. Under shell. Thanks, Kate. Uh, the the other the last one I wanted to ask listener question was someone that's a sole trader and how do you set boundaries for workloads? Because this questioner said that they found they're reaching the point where they can't take on new clients, even though inquiries are through the roof, and they don't want to say no because they know they can help them and extra money is always great, uh, but don't want to be working twenty four seven. My first thing would be if they've got heaps and heaps of inquiries coming through, should you increase your pricing? If you've got this huge, if you're totally booked out, well, I think it's time to raise your prices, first thing. Um, Secondly, to answer the question about boundaries, oh, boundaries are so hard when you're in a small business. Like as a small business owner, I feel this on a deep level of... You know, you're all, you feel like you're always on and you're always yeah. working. And how do you separate your, your personality from the business when you are the business? It's, it's a big challenge. It's such a challenge. For me, the thing that's really helped with boundaries has been working out what am I saying yes to? So often we think about boundaries as what do I say no to? I'm going to say no to this client. I'm going to say no to that opportunity because it's going to take me too much time. Instead, what I want you to think about is what are you saying yes to? So for for me, when I say no to working on a Saturday, it's because I'm saying yes to my family time. When I say no to an opportunity with a new client, it's because I'm saying yes to servicing the current clients that I have really well. So we think about what am I saying yes to? What are my big ticks? What are the things that are are just non-negotiable to me? And then you build your boundaries around that. Like another example is I often get requests from people regularly to mentor. To they ask, "Oh, can we catch up for coffee? Would you consider, you know, doing some coaching with me or or mentoring?" For me, I have a boundary of I say yes to two people. I'm only going to mentor two people at any one time. No more than that. So when I say no to that person that comes along and requests that, it's because I've already said yes and committed wholeheartedly to these two people. So I want you to think about it in that way. It's just a really helpful way to reframe the boundaries conversation. It gives us this, this easy kind of decision matrix almost to, to say, okay, that's outside of my scope at the moment. And think about the long game. So I want you to think about when it comes to your boundaries, your career is a marathon. It's not a sprint. So think about what are the things that are going to engage me and energize me or what are the things that are going to deplete me? And if we only think about the short-term wins, we do become more exposed to risk of burnout. So 
I hope that helps this person, the sole trader or, or anyone who's thinking about starting a business. These are some of the important things that you need to think through. And boundaries are a hard thing to learn and even harder to put in practice, especially if you're used to saying yes to everything. And I think that's a really important reminder to really consider by saying no, what are you saying yes to? Or by saying yes, what other opportunities or time uh, even to relax and spend time with friends who you saying no to there? Because often it's those things we say yes and no to that will determine how our year looks. And I, I mean, I find it hard, but as you said, having some of those simple rules like mentoring only two people at a time. For me, I looked at my calendar in, uh, at the start of the year and said, I've got all of these things on the go, so I cannot say yes to any more recurring events until I reevaluate in the middle of the year. So, one-off events was okay, but anything that is happening on a weekly basis, I can't add any more of those activities to my plate. And so, now when something comes up, I have that clear rule set and I'm not allowing myself to break it, but it's hard. It's such a discipline. You're so right. It is really challenging. Well, Shel, there's a lot there. And there was one question that's been on my mind recently that I wanted to ask you. And so this is my own question. Um, and I was I was listening to an episode that Owen recorded recently for the Investors Podcast, but we also aired it on the Finance Podcast. And it's with a successful Australian venture capitalist called Nick Crocker. And he was talking about how the pursuit of greatness can often cause harm to the people around you and the importance of really spending some time thinking about how you minimize that impact on the people around you. Because I often think about, okay, I've got these five things on the go. I'm working really hard for my own goals, but it often means I spend less time calling family or maybe I neglect a few things that I promised to do for someone else. And I'm interested in hearing your perspective that if we're pursuing a big career, business or education goal, how do we actually stay grounded along the journey? Wow, that is an awesome question. How do you stay grounded? And I think we often need to think about uh, one of my mentors, Rowan Dredge. I don't know if he would, I would call him a mentor. He probably wouldn't see him that way, but he's given me so much good advice over the years. And he's a CEO and leadership coach. And he talks about this idea of what is it like to be on the other side of me? Mm -hmm. So what is it? Often we think about, we just go through life solely thinking about our own desires, needs, wants. But actually, when we think about what, it's this idea of not just self-awareness, but other awareness. How aware of others am I? And for anyone interacting with me, my team, my family, my friends, what is it like to be on the other side of me? How are people experiencing me? So building up that other awareness to go, all right, well, if I'm pursuing all my goals and I'm kicking huge goals, but it's coming at the expense of the people that matter to me, well, am I prepared to pay that price? Like, am I prepared to pay that price? Because that's a big cost. And my husband and I, Sam, we often talk about this idea in our family. We have regular check-ins because we both run our own businesses. We both like work really hard and we have to come back to what is this costing us? What is this actually costing us? And are we comfortable with the cost? And so that's a big question to ask yourself. And there's two there. So I want you to ask yourself, What is it like to be on the other side of me? That's something that I learned from Rowan. And then the second question is, what is this costing us? What is this costing my people? And am I prepared to pay that? Yeah, and often those costs aren't felt to a few years down the track. You might not realize straight away, but it it compounds over time. Yeah, and I love... I love that idea that it compounds, Kate, and and that's the thing. We don't notice it in the early stages because they're only small little costs early on, but you're right, it compounds, it grows over time. And the other thing that I would love to leave your listeners with is this idea of when we think about our careers, it's less about what we do and more about who are we becoming. Mm. So who am I becoming? You know, when people introduce themselves and they're like, if I go to a wedding, I'm like, hey, hey, I'm Shelly Johnson. I'm not going to introduce myself as, hey, I'm Shelly Johnson and I'm a HR consultant. 
That's what I do, but that's not who I am. So I really want you to think about who are you becoming along the way because that is the most important thing. It's not what you do. It's not the bloody successes or goals that you kick, even though they're fun and important. It's who am I becoming? I love that one because that's very future focused as well. And it's thinking about, well, what's next on your trajectory? Not Because if you say your job title, that's kind of who you were in the past and all the skills that have led to date. But who am I becoming, becoming is looking very future focused and what is the person I want to be and how are all the choices and the things I say yes and no to going to shape that? Totally. I'm 100% with you. I love that idea of future focused. Wonderful. Well, I think I was going to ask you what the number one thing you want to leave listeners with, but I think you've answered that, Shell. And I think those questions, the how are others experiencing me for, for anyone listening? And I don't know if how you would do that practically, but even just checking in with friends and family and asking them, them these questions maybe once a year. Um, I don't know if you have any suggestions on how to do that. Yeah, totally. Ask those people that are closest to you. You do want to ask safe people. So if you have a partner, if you have your, if you're close with your family, ask them, what's it like to be on the other side of me? Like just straight out, ask them. And, and if you've got a really trusting and safe relationship, they'll tell you and they'll let you know your blind spots. I know Sam, my husband tells me my blind spots all the time. It's like a relentless thing, but that you need, we need that. That's how we stay grounded. Yeah. And sometimes it can take a, a while to tell that other person, I'm comfortable with you telling me how you're experiencing me. You don't need to sugarcoat it. I, I want the honest truth and I'm going to do something with that information. Exactly. Yes. Wonderful. Well, how are others experiencing? Am I prepared to pay that cost? And who am I becoming? I think they're great questions to leave listeners with, Shell. They definitely are going to make me think and I hope they, they give everyone else something to ponder. But if people want to grab a copy of your brand new book, Sort Your Career Out, because it do really does cover everything from the mindset of values to applying for your new job to actually developing yourself in the workplace and having those difficult conversations when you want to quit, where is the best place to grab that? Anywhere good books are sold. So online, in store, pretty much everywhere you can find the book. And the other thing that we didn't talk about is we tell you all the ways to make more money, which we, I know your listeners will love because we all want to make more money. So get on it, buy the book. It'll really help. Yeah, well, uh, a small price to pay for a book that will hopefully really mean that you have an impactful work week and you make more money, you kick your career goals and you still have time for the other good things in life. Well, Shell, thank you so much for coming on the show today. Thanks so much, Kate, for having me. Thanks for listening to this episode of the Australian Finance Podcast. We hope you learned something new and were able to take one thing away from this episode. If you're keen to learn more, head on over to Rask Education and take one of our free money and investing courses. You could even become a Rask Core member for less than your Netflix subscription each month. And don't forget to subscribe for new episodes in your inbox every week. Plus, if you enjoyed the show, we'd love you to leave us a five-star review on Apple Podcasts or Spotify and send any questions our way via the link in the description. And before we go on, did this podcast contain personal financial advice just for me? Absolutely not, Kate. Our podcast actually contains general financial information only. What that means is the information does not take into account your financial needs, goals, objectives, or even your situation. So because of that, it's important that you consider if the information is appropriate to you and your needs before acting on it. If that all sounds a bit confusing or you're still working out what your needs are, it's a great idea to consult a licensed and trusted financial planner. And don't forget to do your own research. This podcast was proudly sponsored by InvestSmart's Bootcamp for Beginner Investors. Build your investing confidence for only $49.50. Learn what it takes to be a successful investor with InvestSmart's Bootcamp for Beginners. This online course is self-paced over three months with live weekly webinars designed to help you achieve your financial goals and create wealth. To start your investing journey today, head to investsmart.com.au bootcamp or simply click the link in your podcast player.